Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And hi, Mike. It's great to see you again. I'm excited to dig into the death of the cookie, what's next, and how brands can adapt with you today. So thanks for joining us. Thrilled to be here. Thrilled to, thrilled to be here. Awesome. So I'm going to start out with an easy question, one that we can all relate to in these times. Um, so with all this time spent at home during COVID, what are you and your family currently streaming? Well, uh, it's funny. Um, my son and I both got our second vaccine on Saturday, and we planned to leave Sunday fully open just in case we need to recover. So we binged the last season of Parks and Rec. And so that was a fantastic sort of bonding time between the two, uh, between him and I. And then my wife and I have been um, sort of catching up on shows that we missed. So uh, we watched Ken's Convenience, which is fantastic. Um, and, okay. then, and then going way back, we've been uh, catching up on a new girl, which we never saw. And it's, it's sort of dated, it, you know, there's flip phones and those types of things, but, but it's fun that with streaming world, like you can actually go back and, and catch that stuff that you missed. Right. Like go back in time. I know. I think I need to take your lead and dive into some sitcoms. I've been going hard in the documentaries and dramas. We just finished this as a robbery on Netflix. Highly recommend if you haven't seen it. And last night I did start uh, the first episode of season four of Handmaid's Tale. So talk about dark. Um, so I think I need to lighten up my viewing behavior and uh, take a page out of your book. So I'll check out those recommendations. Yeah, my wife has a rule. If it doesn't feel good, she's not going to watch it. <laughs> Probably a good rule. And congrats on the second vaccine. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, so jumping into the topic at hand, uh, you know, given the dramatic shifts in consumer behavior due to the pandemic, what are the challenges and opportunities coming out of the past year that Pepsi can take to better serve their customers moving into the future? You know, the the shift towards streaming over the last year, I mean, everyone's talked about it, right? Um, it's like we're in a time machine, right? We're 10 years in the future. And, um, and now we're in a world that we can really analyze what does addressable TV look like? Um, and so that, that is really super exciting. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, before this time, and even before, you know, we were confronted with, you know, a post-cookie world, uh, we've been building a very robust, addressable internal audience capability. And so really our opportunity is how do we find the channels to most effectively deploy uh, those audiences? Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, OTT is, is going to be a huge opportunity as we go forward. Yeah, so how are you thinking about the shift and how you're changing your investment or strategy approach to CTV? And, you know, it's not easy just to shift everything over. So as you think about the landscape and how you're approaching this, is, is there a method to the madness or? Yeah, I mean, there, there really is. I mean, culturally, right, we have been, you know, doing the biggest and best commercials for decades. Yeah right? Half a century, century, like it's, as long as there's TV. Um, I mean, see the shirt, right? Like back in the day, right? When Pepsi was, 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 was five cents. Um, and so the question is, how do we get more sort of precise uh, in the messaging? Um, and when we look at uh, addressable TV, it's, is addressable TV delivering of the same capabilities as, as broadcast. Uh, and what's, what's fascinating is we in-housed our attribution modeling um, uh, over the last few years. And so uh, the econometrics model is really showing that, you know, as we shift towards digital, um, we are seeing greater performance. And then within digital, we're gonna look channel by channel to figure out where our consumers are, right? And how are they, um, you know, reacting and responding to the messaging we're putting out there. So we really let the numbers lead the way um, and use the numbers to help us uh, drive cultural change, right? And, and I think cultural change is a big, big, big aspect of it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, in this space, we can be held accountable and we can measure performance directly. I mean, COVID just accelerated the shift and we're not going back. People aren't going to go back to hook up to their, you know, linear cable subscription that they had historically. So it's really interesting to see this. And then also think about all of these legacy media companies that are now reorienting around streaming and launching new streaming services. So, you know, as we think about more and more viewers shifting to the space and the landscape becoming more fragmented, how is your team thinking about region frequency and managing that, um, you know, as we shift into this more fragmented landscape? Yeah, I mean, post-COVID landscape too, right? I mean, um, right. Sorry, post, post -cookie. <laughs> Let's get post cookie. Right, right, right. <laughs> So much uh, disruption and uncertainty, you know, is in our future. Um, I think, you know, 
really what we focus is on is how do we stabilize what we know um, so that we can adapt to what's changing. Um, and so, you know, with frequency, uh, previously in a, in, a, in a cookie world, we would be able to manage uh, frequency across the board. Now we're going to have to sort of look at, uh, you know, these walled gardens or silos and, and the walls growing taller. Uh, and, and how do we find partners with those ID graphs of the authenticated um, and addressable individuals? And, and can we look at frequency across channel? I think that is still that, you know, that, that chapter is still to be written um, of how well we're going to be able to do that. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing we can lean on is, is what we've been doing within the Walt Garden so far as well as, so how do you manage frequency uh, within, within the Walt Gardens? I think also the question is what's the right frequency? Right, like, is it is it once a week? Is it you know twice a week? I think that has always been sort of a challenge, and and um, and you can report on frequency. The question is, how well can you manage towards the frequency? I think is you know the bigger question. Right. I mean, I think that's how we're looking at it too. With our one platform, and yes, this is on the Roku platform, but it's the largest streaming platform in the U.S. So thinking about how do we manage for reaching frequency from linear television using our ACR data all the way down the funnel through CTV, OLV, display, mobile, et cetera. And you know, not only reporting out and as you're talking about, but how do you pull those levers in real time from a programmatic perspective to be able to manage to that five per week or 10 per week or whatever you determine is that optimal frequency. Yeah, and I, you know, I think what's, what's also really interesting is like, are you doing frequency at a household level? Are you able to have individual profiles on that CTV platform so that right. you can identify who was exposed? I think um, there's a lot of opportunity as we gain, you know, um, you know, capabilities around that area. Um, and so, you know, maybe we can lean in because we can see now see who's watching TV because they can identify their profile uh, right. versus, you know, previously with cable, like people wouldn't take the time uh, to identify who they were. Um, so I think there's there's also you know a lot of opportunity in the, in the changes. Right, and historically on cable television, there were no frequency controls between the channels, right? So at least we're we're moving in the right direction. So right. Um, yeah, that's great. So as brands are putting more value on data, especially as they invest more in programmatic tools, how does Pepsi quickly optimize campaigns and reallocate spend based on shifting consumer habits or other market forces? Yeah, I think, you know, in a post cookie world that is going to become more challenging. And I think, you know, specifically you said programmatic. I think programmatic, you know, previously we would use our DMP um, and we would be able to manage frequency on target frequency across DSPs. Um, you know, that was cookie based. And so we're, we're really, you know, need to determine that. I think, you know, the key is, is that um, we have a sense of who we want to talk to as far as every household in the country. Um, and so how do we address all those individuals? Which media partners are going to allow us to address those individuals? Um, and then we could start to look at sort of probabilistic uh, nature of, you know, what's the probability that this household reached this frequency um, or the message was reached that individual on that channel. And then you could say, right. well, you need to heavy up on sort of uh, that same audience on another channel. So. I think uh, similar to what Molly and Christine were talking about in the previous session, it's about really owning your data as much as you can and owning your data strategy. So doing a full sort of audit and strategy around um, who you need to talk to. For us, it's every single household right. in the country. And then what does that household mean to us? Which brands are most appropriate? And then how do we help find those individuals? Right, and then how do you partner with those partners that actually have a one-to-one -one connection with their consumers, therefore having deterministic data, so you can have a you know a more effective or efficient match there between your segments and you know while at the same time hitting your your entire population that you're looking for. Yeah, I mean I, I, we've we've heard a lot right about authentication is going to become more and more critical. Right, the anonymous viewer or the anonymous reader um, is is. Um, you know, going to be incentivized to identify themselves. Um, I think hopefully that I, that reader will also, or that viewer will also benefit from that, right? Though once they identify themselves, they can have more relevant uh, messaging sent to them. Um, and so, you know, the the challenges is is that going to be a behavior that the viewer or reader takes on? 
Right. Yep. It's yet to be seen. I mean, I think more relevant advertising is beneficial, right? As you're watching. <laughs> the frequency management, right? Like, and like frequency we've, all, management. we've all been there when like we're on a, a streaming video platform and we just see the same commercial over and over and over again. So I hope we'll be able to sort of exit out of that, that kind of. Right. Experience. And that's what we're trying to solve for too, right? Not just on the Roku channel, but across all media, omni-channel, um, because we want our users to have the best possible experience that they can have. So we're user first as well. So talking about, you know, the death of the cookie, the future, how is Pepsi reacting to the changes in legislation that are adjusting the way online identity can be utilized? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it is how do we find the opportunities to build that one-to-one -one relationship with, with the consumer? Um, you know, the, the, the intention of the laws is to protect the consumer. I think that's very important uh, for all corporations to understand that it is about your relationship with the consumer and the mutual respect. Um, and so the hope is that that one-to-one uh, -one relationship will allow us to have a more relevant uh, conversation with that individual. Um, you know, if they're gracious and willing enough to, to allow us to understand who they are, then we could really start to sit you know, determine are they responding to uh, this product or that product? Um, how do we give them more relevant uh, information around that? So um, in the long run, right, hopefully it will build stronger relationships between brands and consumers. Um, I think there's certainly a huge reaction to uh, how the industry is going to, um, you know, play that role. Um, and can we, uh, find a middle ground where we can still continue to bring value. Um, we've talked about the you know the challenges of fre frequency management in the post cookie world could actually make a worse consumer experience, right? right. Gonna, if we can't manage frequency because we can't track the cookie, then they theoretically can be getting the same message over and over and over again, um, and it'll be hard for us to progress the story to the next chapter in that messaging. Um, and so, you know, I think hopefully there's a middle ground that we can find that will benefit both parties. Yeah, no, I mean, I echo your sentiments completely on the one-to-one -one relationship standpoint. I mean, here at Roku, that's everything that we're built on, that one-to-one -one relationship. Um, it's how we effectively target. We're, you know, rooted in that deterministic data. And I think that's why we're looking to the future of, of one view, all being rooted in that deterministic data. So you can utilize that across not only your Roku media buys, but across all of your buys, right? So then you understand how many times is that viewer being hit by that same commercial um, across the different channels? Um, and then not just across the different channels, looking at the big screen, right? So then we can start taking it down the funnel. We can start looking at omni-channel, uh, you know, in the future dynamic ad insertion and linear. So it's, it's quite interesting about how we can think about that from a platform perspective versus individual channel um, placement. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, as Pepsi is heavily invested in first party data, um, how are you utilizing it to create a more relevant relationship with your consumer? Um, would love to hear more on that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, our audience is everyone, right? Our audience is every single household um, in, in the country. And so we have first party data understandings and, and, and we have a, a large third party data understandings and it's where those two meet that allow us to um, understand, you know, how do we probabilistically target everyone? And for those individuals that we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship, first of all, how do, you know, how does that uh, third party data give us greater insight on what their interests could be? Um, and, then, and then as we build our first party um, relationship, how do we sort of verify that understanding and drive a deeper relationship? Um, and so that first party relationship allows us to, um, you know, continue that conversation across multiple channels, right? We can bring that, um, that, uh, that conversation to Roku. And then we understand, yes, we told them chapter one of a Pepsi right. story on Roku. And then we could bring that conversation to Facebook and, and give them the chapter two of that story. And so, only with the first party data will we ensure that relationship and that conversation will continue. And having specific messaging, are you thinking about it that way too? Like you have your broad messaging and then you also follow specific segments? 
Yeah, ideally, like uh, our business needs to continue to have sort of large broadcast messaging, right? And and where is the most efficient place to do that? And then where do we invest in sort of that one-to-one consumer cultivation, um, that one-to-one sort of relationship where we can say, let's bring you some value. Let's bring you some value with some entertainment. Let's bring you some value with an interesting product or an interesting flavor. Um, let's bring you some value to say, here's the next product you might think about think about purchasing. Yeah, it's interesting to think about that customer journey and how you're interacting with them. And so it's not just about frequency, that's a huge part of it, but then it's also about following the consumer and, and bringing them down the funnel and, and then engaging with them in different ways across yeah. their journey. I mean, every, every impression that we give to someone that's redundant, that means that one, that person might start to establish fatigue. Uh, and, and that also means that someone else we can't talk to, right? So we only have so much money and it needs to be spread so we can, you know, talk to as many relevant consumers as possible. Yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, thinking about it, are you going back to kind of your measurement topic, um, how are you thinking about these different channels from a measurements perspective? So we think about the shift and we know kind of how linear television was measured, but how are you really thinking about it from a connected TV standpoint, you know, aside from really the lower funnel um, performance base potentially? I mean, it, it, it's really going to where the consumers are. So, you know, as they shift, um, we need to hit the largest population um, in the most efficient way yeah. uh, in a environment where we can capture their attention. And so, you know, um, it, it's interesting to say, you know, is a skippable commercial where we have the first five seconds perform different than a you know a full length commercial where they need to view the entire thing before they continue the show that they're watching. Um, I think there are interesting sort of legacy, you know, strategies and broadcasts. Are you in position, you know, the first position or the last position or the middle position within the within the commercial block, uh, and and how do those types of strategies trans translate over to the streaming streaming world as well? So. It's a, it's a complicated aspect in how do all of these elements uh, translate into effectiveness? Totally, I mean, not all impressions are created equal. So, right, you have your baseline pricing, but then how do the, all these other levers come in and, and, and impact performance? And especially as we start talking you know, about cookies and, and the deprecation of that, how do you become most effective at reaching those viewers, the empowered consumer um, with the relevant messaging. Yep. All right. Well, that's all I had. I don't know if you have any last thoughts before I flip over to the q and I'm just really excited. Again, you know, there's acceleration in the last, uh, last year. I'm a big sort of silver lining type of person and the shift towards streaming. Um, you know, I watch, you know, on my, my Roku, I watch on my Apple TV, I watch on my phone. I could pick it up anywhere. And I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to be able to you know, pick up that content wherever I can. Yeah, I agree. I, it's great for the consumer and I think it's great for the advertiser and we'll get there. We'll figure out how to do it in the most privacy safe way, how to manage that frequency. It's just, we're going to have to work together as we, as we evolve these practices. Absolutely. All right. Let me open up the chat widget here. Let's see what we have. Okay. So many brands have drastically reduced media budgets over the past year. How has your media plan adjusted? If your budget has been reduced, have you gotten more creative and efficient with your strategies? I think every year budgets will increase or reduce, you know, depending on how the businesses are doing. Um, the question is always, is the investment in the media we're delivering, you know, delivering a return. And so I think, you know, how have we adjusted? Um, it's a balance of efficiency for reach and effectiveness. Um, we have certain media partners that are very effective, uh, but they're, they're very expensive um, and, and, and vice versa. So I think it is always looking at the overall, overall ROI that looks at the, um, the intersection point between efficiency and reach. Um, you know, whether we have funding cost or not, uh, we're going towards the ones that have the highest ROI. Yeah, makes sense. All right, I have another question here. Um, curious how Pepsi has first party data on consumers as most all transactions are through a third party purchase. Yeah, I mean, you know, 
you're absolutely correct on our purchases, but we're also one of the largest, um, you know, promotions company in, in, in the world, right? So we have direct relationships because we have great brand relationships with our consumers. Uh, Mountain Dew really, you know, goes deep into, um, you know, gaming. And so our gaming promotions with our gaming partners, uh, we determine how do we bring value through our brands to the consumer. That value might be the product itself, but the value could also be sort of Mountain Dew sponsored gaming experience. And so for many, many years, we've had these sort of, um, you know, rich, um, consistent uh, relationships with our consumers. It's a great question. Um, and it is a, a very broad relationship. I think, you know, the depth is coming as we go more into D2C. Yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, next up, what innovations and technologies are you utilizing to execute your strategies? Has that changed since the pandemic began? Um, no, I think one of the things is uh, our strategy is to uh, stabilize and know why and be very sort of deliberate on the technologies we use so we can adapt to the change. And so, you know, we have uh, stabilized our consumer data, as I spoke about earlier, um, and through that, for that consumer data, we have established our um, our activation channels, our you know data activation channels that bring that data to our partners. That stuff hasn't changed. Um, I think what is changing is as we're looking at the post cookie world, is which partners are going to be most resilient in that world. Um, we know that we are going to be looking across multiple ID graphs. So how do we get our head around um, sort of managing? Uh, across those ID graphs. I think that's sort of the biggest challenge. Right. Okay, so dovetailing off that, another question. Um, how are you de determining where to spend time on emerging technologies and which emerging technologies do you focus on? That's that's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, really it is not what technology, but what problem are we trying to solve? And then we go look for the technology. So so first we wanna say, okay, do a full assessment and gap analysis of your existing technology. Uh, know what those technologies are solving for and why they exist. And if they don't have a, a use case, cut them. Um, and then, so you simplify, right? You standardize and you simplify. Then you go through your gap analysis process, determine you know, what business needs you have. And then you start looking for the technology. I think you know, the biggest risk is you know, we are continually getting calls from you know, startups and tech companies to say, I've got this idea. It's like, great, but here's my problem. Let me go find the technology. Right. And so within PepsiCo, we have a labs program. And so that labs program is specifically focused on going after the, the, you know, the challenges um, that we're trying to solve. So you know, personalization is gonna be clear, right? Um, how do we sort of you know, drive greater personalization and greater relevant conversations is, is sort of one of those opportunities. Cool. Hi, moving on now, and this is a question that always comes up, uh, you know, in our day to day is looking at content first or context first channels versus a, a audience based and how does that relate to a cookie list future I think you know here at Roku we sell audience based first and foremost highly targeted one to one that's what's most successful and that's all mapped back to our first party one to one connection with our uh, consumers so kind of interested to hear how you're thinking about that, especially as the shift is happening from linear to uh, uh, connected television and linear historically has been content first. Um, any thoughts there? I think if our consumer is where that context is, I think the context is a huge opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, it is a balance of whether uh, the context helps deliver the consumer or if we need to look for a, a, publisher, like a publishing location that has the consumer. So I think, um, you know, if the context uh, comes through in our analytics and says, well, that context is uh, sufficient and drives value, then that context will succeed. Um, I'm really excited about sort of the overlap. So in a post cookie world, um, the question is, does a con context uh, target become less or more valuable than an addressable target? Um, and then, so we'll see how the efficiency side runs of, of the equation runs on context versus addressable. And then uh, the effectiveness side will determine, you know, where our investment goes. Interesting. So another question here that's really interesting too, and something that we've seen come up a lot, especially during COVID is direct to consumer e-commerce. 
Um, so how are you thinking about that from a performance standpoint, um, performance partnerships or utilizing those types of uh, media outlets to drive to e-commerce? Yeah, so e-commerce for us is a very broad definition. So, right, um, right direct to consumer uh, for a company like PepsiCo is new. Um, and so e-commerce also then extends into our click and collect world through our retailer partners, um, as well as sort of our retailers sort of e-commerce. So our goal is to drive, you know, um, you know, the sales process, right? How do we, you know, what's the path to purchase and how do we facilitate that path to purchase? Um, and so we are learning with our own D2C capability, but that path to purchase, certainly um, the largest side of that is on our retailer partners um, and the logistics behind, you know, how do we deliver our product in an e-commerce world? Uh, so it's, it's very exciting and it's very exciting for us from a first party data perspective to understand which consumers want to participate with our products in, a, in an e-commerce capability. Interesting, yeah. Uh, so another question here, uh, does Pepsi utilize a synthetic ID to identify, measure and target against and what third party data is most interesting? So, or sports data or other types of third party data partnerships? Yeah, I mean, for us, right, first you want to sell to the people that are buying your product or we think are buying our product. I think that's that's step number one. Um, and then then we have to start to look at um, which areas are opportunities for growth uh, and which, um, you know, lifestyles and interests um, have the greatest propensity to growth. And so that's where we would start to sort of look at other data sets. Um, those other data sets also help us understand of the current purchasers, you know, what are they interested in well. So that we go towards sort of look like targeting, it helps inform our creative, right? So if we have someone that is um, interested in, in volleyball, we start to get a sense of how many people are interested in volleyball, how many pieces of creative do we want to put out for sort of Pepsi in the summer and volleyball. So, um, so that additional interest-based data not only helps us understand the consumer, but also helps us make sure that we can have a more relevant sort of conversation with that consumer. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, two more questions I see here. Do you see blind cooperative databases becoming more important with all these changes? So, yes. Um, I think an environment that allows corporations to respect and adhere to the privacy of the consumer is critical. Um, the granularity of the data that passes back and forth uh, is gonna be dependent upon that privacy. Um, the ability to establish a safe barber or clean room um, or blind cooperative here, um, I think certainly will be necessary so that we can have uh, the appropriate granularity be passed uh, between, between organizations to determine uh, the performance of, of the work that's happening. And again, ultimately to be as, mo as relevant as you can back to that consumer. So uh, yes, I think um, this type of environment is gonna be critical. How many are they? Uh, how many are there? Because there are all these different publishers and advertisers. Uh, how many can a corporation manage? Like, how do we get our head around? Like, how many different um, clean rooms uh, can we manage and, and set up? So the answer is yes. I think it's sort of to be determined about how corporations can sort of manage that process. Yeah, interesting. All right, last question. And on a lighter note, have you actually tried Mango Pepsi? Um, so my wife's allergic to mango, so I can't have it anywhere else. <laughs> uh, we do love mango, but she can't have it anymore. So no, unfortunately, I haven't. Um, I imagine it is delicious. No, our favorite right now, so we're big bubbly fans. And so yeah. the favorite bubbly is um, grapefruit bubbly. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right, well, Mike, this was great. Um, you know, thanks so much for taking the time and thanks to the audience, all the questions. Uh, really enjoyed the chat, taking away kind of what the future holds, the one-to-one -one direct connection with the consumer, building out first-party data. Um, that's really, really important. Yeah, Jessica, it's been so good to talk to you, even if it's virtual. Thanks yes, so much. same. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, back to me now. That was a great conversation, Mike and Jessica. Mike, I need to give you props for the Pepsi T-shirt because I don't know if, I don't know how many people caught that. He's got this great old school Pepsi T-shirt and the, the first of our speakers to do branding. So on the call. So so 
that, that good, good for that. And just overall, it was a really interesting conversation because you do have, you know, Pepsi is, as you, as you noted, the, your audience is everybody. And, you know, how are you, it's really interesting to hear how you're looking at this new world where everything seems to be hyper-targeted or at least somewhat targeted and how you deal with it. And then also, you know, the, excuse me, the cookie list future and then how that's relating to TV, which is interesting. Our TV rev research for what it's worth has shown that consumers anyway are not overly concerned with people knowing what they watch on TV. They sort of feel like, okay, in digital, that's like where it gets super invasive, but on television, you know, hey, your know, best case is like, they won't cancel my favorite show or, you know, do I really care that somebody knows that I watch, you know, the Tonight Show and Parks and Rec? Probably not, you know, so that's okay. And if it leads to better recommendations or, or more relevant advertising, all the better. You know, that, that may change as, as sort of hype and awareness go up. But for now, TV seems to be on a slightly different, different place. Um, so it's, it's interesting, interesting sort of just take on it. So I want to thank you and Jessica very much um, for all that. Jessica, we are big fans of Roku, um, so thank you. And um, now we're going to go over to the next session of the day. We're going to have Christopher Thomas Moore, who is the Vice President of Media, Digital Marketing, and